Welcome. This is Fan Animation Celebration, and it's uh, it's a, a big panel on some of the greatest voiceover talent and just talent in general about animation. So you're going to be in a fun fun room for at least I don't know 45 minutes, I think, until they kick us out, and, and then I don't know what's coming in here next. I think how to knit with your grandma or someone. Else. <laughs> But you get to knit yourself a wonderful, wonderful cosplay costume. Don't worry about it. Uh, I will be your host for this panel. My name is Brian O'Halloran. Uh, you're like, well, what are you doing up there? You're some sort of hack actor. I'm like, well, I've actually done cartoon voices, surprisingly enough. Uh, I did uh, Clerks, the uh, animated series. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, people always say, well, why is not on anymore? And I was like, because that's ABC, and ABC sucks. <laughs> And friends like, well, I love seeing it when it's on, uh, you know, uh, Comedy Central or on uh, Adult Swim. And I was like, write them, email them, email the hell out of them, you know, because eventually they're going to go, look, we're making, we, this is too much money we're giving up by not making more. So, or until the evil empire that is uh, ABC uh, uh, dies in a horrible car crash. It was awful. You could just put a whole network into a car and push them off a cliff. It'd be awesome. <laughs> I think they did that. It was called UPN. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Which we, were, we, which we were first offered, by the way, a full season of with UPN, and then ABC's like, what? No, it's our property, they can't have it. We'll give you a Super Bowl ad. And then they were like, ha ha ha. And then Who Wants to Be a Millionaire came, and then that it crushed our dreams. They were like, game shows are the future, we'll just have game shows forever and ever. Not realizing that animation was really the way to go. Right, Fox? Of course, right. <laughs> so, uh, if my guests are ready backstage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to introduce them one-on-one. -on -one. When the guests come around the screen here, come to the very far right hand and we'll see it in that order. If for some reason you can't stand certain people, then you can fight amongst yourselves as to where you're sitting. Stage right. Yeah, my stage right. Come on, I'm a theater actor. Of course it's stage right. <laughs> All right, let's bring them on. Do we have everybody now? Are we still waiting or are we good? We're good? We're good. Let's bring on, in no particular order, so don't think anybody's any more important than another, but John DiMaggio. <laughs> Playing second base, Maurice Limache. <laughs> Olivia Olson. <laughs> and playing center, Jeremy Shada. <laughs> and Hinton Walsh. And some dude I am not familiar with this guy at all, Mr. Billy West. Hey! Oh my God! Thank you. You know when I met you? Mm -hmm. Back when the Stern Show had a screening of Clerks, and we were sitting there in the, in the uh, little, you know, the special little theater where rich people get to go before the movies. The screening room, the press screening room, right, and we get to sit in the glass booth while crying while people are hating our films. I know it well. No, but I, I love it then. Thank you, Billy. I, I, that's an honor. I, and I can't gush enough how much I love your work. Sit down. <laughs> Sorry. And now it begins. We are limited to four microphones, ladies and gentlemen, so uh, please be curious to pass along the microphones. I, I don't need one. And, and th there you go. A, a true theatrical actor knows how to project. So uh, we're going to just start out, for those who are new to the genre or are new to these gentlemen and ladies' uh, careers, going down the end from you, sir, Mr. Dimaggio, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, um, I like french fries. That's what I like. <laughs> no. Um, I, I play the voice of Bender on Futurama and a bunch of other uh, voices on that show with Jake uh, on, on Adventure Time, Jake the Dog. Uh, um, uh, schnitzel on, uh, on, uh, on Chowder and, uh, and Marcus Phoenix, Gears of War and a whole bunch of other stuff. But I am beat me all year. <laughs> My name is Maurice LaMarche, and uh, I am, uh, I play the, I was the brain on Pinky and the Brain. 
And I did nothing until, no. <laughs> Bunch of stuff until Futurama where I'm Lieutenant Kiff Croker and Morbo the newscaster. Calculon, the star of all my circuits. <laughs> The bomb bot and clamps <laughs> and he is a <laughs> And uh, I'm also on uh, I'm also on a new show that's just on the air now, Rescue Bots, Transformers Rescue Bots, which is for the little ones where I'm Chief Charlie Burns. I'm the patriarch of a family of first responders, and I'm also the voice of Lexus, the 2013 Lexus GS. <laughs> oh my God, that is you. <laughs> I never afford Alexis, but somehow I was like, I'm always attracted to this voiceover. Why? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, what up? I'm Olivia Olson. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I work on Phineas and Ferb. I do the voice of Vanessa Doofenshmirtz. <laughs> and um, Marcelina Vampire Queen on Adventure Time. You may know me from Love Actually. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hello there, my name is Jeremy Shada. Woo. I do the voice of Finn the Human on Adventure Time. Woo. Uh, I was Robin in Batman the Brave and the Bold. Yeah. And I also did another show called Incredible Crew, which is a sketch comedy thing. Yeah. Certainly isn't, but he's an amalgamation of every big dumb announcer I ever met in my life. Oh. It's because I go there. Kip! Kip, have the boy pick up my underwear. The boy, sir? You! You pick up my underwear, Kip. Yes, sir. You're the boy. Oh. <laughs> and um, Dr. Zoidberg was a couple of comedians from the old days. One was a, a marble mouth comedian years ago named George Jessel, and he, he had jokes like, they were corny, but they were funny, because he was a marble mouth. And he'd say, you know the definition uh, of a smart ass? A fellow that can sit on an ice cream cone and tell you what flavor it is. You know, and, uh, and then there was uh, this other guy, Lou Jacoby, from like Yiddish theater. And, Everybody knows him, you know, if you saw the first Arthur, he leans into Arthur and goes, What's it like to have all that money? It doesn't <laughs> suck. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I just slammed those two together. Fry was basically me. I was a complainer and I was whiny and I used to play in a band and i go, What am I going to do now? I broke a string. You know, that's exactly what I sound like. <laughs> and, um, you know, I mean, I'd be drunk with my friends in the band and everything, and I used to say stupid stuff because I was inebriated. And one of them was like, you know, I said to my friend, Hey, what time is it? He goes, two. I go, a clock? 
<laughs> you know, that could have been a Futurama line. Sure, could have been. Hey, Johnny, why are your own meme? Why are you doing Bender and stuff over there? I'm just waiting for a shot, baby. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> I'm waiting to get in there. I'm waiting to weasel in and weasel right back out. I'm done. Because of you, I don't want to live on this planet anymore. Get up, old man! <laughs> do you guys ever find that? Like, in the studio, first of all, do you guys record separately and together? What was your normal routine we, with recording? We, they record, they record, um, they record everything first, and then they animate to our voices. Yeah, we did but, our best, we, we did our best, because we're all out of work now. No. For the time being, for the time being, but um, don't count Futurama out. Yeah. No, no. Uh, but we uh, we would always, to the best of our ability, be a cast. Um, we yeah. played off each other. They, really well. That and that really helps in a recording. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, uh, if you know, if somebody couldn't be there, you know, somebody else would fill in for them. You know, uh, Tress McNeil. Tress McNeil got, got a yeah, like, very good doing Katie well. Seagal. Um, because Katie was so busy doing Sons of Anarchy all the time. And other shows, I mean, how many shows has she been on? Tons. She's got like at least four like long-running things. Yeah. She's, I mean, the, the, woman, the woman never stops working. Yeah. And neither should she, she's an amazing guy. Yeah. I said to her, one time I said to her, Katie, I just realized this, you've never not been a star. And she was just so gracious about it. And then we found out she had a band, and we went to go watch her sing, and she was breaking my heart. She was so good. Ah, unbelievable. I'm yeah. so happy that we worked with her. Mm hmm Great. Awesome. But yeah, we record together. We record together, and if, you know, it, 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 you know it, it, and that's usually the way it comes out the best. What's the, what was the thing that got you started? And everybody in the panel, please go down the line. What got you started in doing voiceover? What was it that someone said, you know, your face is mm, but your voice is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's what I've been told for myself. Just saying. I, I started doing voiceover in New York City uh, when I was doing stand-up comedy, and uh, I had a friend of mine who's on the show Revolution, uh, Zach Orth, he's got the beard, you know. Um, he's a friend of mine, and he was in suburbia at Lincoln Center at the time. I was like, dude, what do you do in between gigs? You're like, how do you keep, make your ends meet? And he's like, you know, and I had been doing commercials and stuff like that at the time. And, you know, I wasn't really, I didn't want to be, hey, you're the double cheeseburger guy. It's like, I don't want to do that anymore. And so I asked, I asked him what he did to make his ends meet. And he said, well, I do a lot of voiceover for commercials. He's like, I'm the, I'm the voiceover for, I'm the, I'm the voice of rallies. So I was like, oh, wow, okay. I was like, okay. So I started thinking about it. I was just like, well, you know, maybe I can give it a shot. And sure enough, I was working with a new manager at the time, and, and she got me, uh, you know, in an office with an agent, a voiceover agent, uh, who had seen my stand-up act and was like, I totally want to work with that guy. And within a week, I had an agent, and I booked my first audition, which was a Toyota radio ad. And uh, yeah, the rest is, I guess, history, as they say. But that's how I started. You know, I started doing commercials in New York. And then when I moved out to Los Angeles, that's where all the animation is. So it just kind of shifted more character work. More almost identical story with me. I was a comic. And I did One of the original uh, 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 young comedians on HBO. His was with Sam Kennison, for crying out loud. This guy, a legend. He was, right around, he was right around that time, like 1984-85. He was doing Young Comedians, was touring with Robin Dangerfield. And voiceover agent from William Morris, Dean this, and Holtz was in the audience at the comedy store and said, you know, with all the impressions you do, they're almost natural for, for voiceover work. And I had been told, as I mentioned in the earlier panel, I won't tell the proper story out again, but, uh, you know, there was a closed door. But she sent me out. Now, you booked in your first week. It took me a year before I got my first job. But she, she, had me, she sent me out in 84. By 1985, I finally booked uh, an episode of uh, The Littles and Wolf Rock TV, and, which was cool because I got to work with Eb and, Mr. Mr. And, and Hank Kimball. They were both, both those actors worked on The Littles, uh, Eb from Green Acres. And then, and then it segued right into the... Uh, Perfect gadget and the real Ghostbusters, and I just really haven't stopped working since. It's because once you once you start showing up in the business and show that you can do it and show up on time, it's like 
you, you build momentum almost right away if you could. You know, it was it was really really kind of cool. So that was how I started with stand-up comedy, learning the chops of doing voices and, and comedic timing in comedy, and then a lucky break. So that was my start. Olivia. Uh, nothing like you guys. Um, I kind of got into it accidentally. I never wanted to be an actor ever, um, but. I was a singer, so I think I got my roles based on, you know, they needed people that could sing for uh, different characters and stuff. There's a lot of music and animated series. So I was a singer who was not yet to be discovered, and through doing that, I just auditioned and um, booked Phineas and Ferb, which uh, created a big open doorway for me, and now I get to work with people like this guy, who I learned so much from, and I love voice acting now, and I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Um, I got into it also different from even all of them, too. Um, I started out doing uh, on-camera stuff, live action, like commercials and TV shows and stuff like that. <clears throat> and then um, I, my agent said, hey, why don't you start going out for some like radio stuff as well? So I started doing a couple radio commercials here and there. And then eventually um, I ended up just working my way up, to the, up through there and doing uh, animated stuff. I did like a thing on Chowder one time. I did a couple other pilots. And then uh, I booked Adventure Time. And my brother had done the pilot three years before that. So my voice sounded just like his. And then it's just kind of mushroomed ever since, and it's kind of awesome because every every week I get to work with John and Tom Kenny and, and Dee Bradley Baker and everybody else, all these awesome people who I've learned a lot from. So, thank you guys. Awesome. Yeah. We love you, John. Oh my God. You're so great. Oh my gosh. Um. Well, I started out in musical theater as a kid. I went to school for voice at North Carolina School of the Arts. So everything was always kind of voice oriented for me. Um, I was on Broadway. I did a play called The Rise and Fall of Little Voice, which was me actually without a mic imitating all these different women like Judy Garland and Billie Holiday and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, doing the, like, the idea of doing animation was always really appealing to me. It just was, I always lived in the wrong place. I lived in Chicago, I lived in New York, and finally I moved to LA. And at the same time of kind of falling out of love with being on camera and being seen, I was totally in love with doing animation and voice work. Um, I did a movie called Jerry Maguire, and was did a whole bunch of ADR afterwards and post with Cameron Crowe and was like, oh my God, can we do the entire movie ADR? Which is just, you know, the actor with, with a microphone and, and filling in the dialogue and the gaps and the stuff they didn't get during the shoot. And it just was, it seemed like the perfect job. Isn't that a Jackie Chan movie? <laughs> 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 no, no, like, no, seriously. He actually films without sound a lot of the times, and they put in the dialogue afterwards, even in their own natural oh, language. They do it, so very cool. it is a technique. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then I, I got, um, I started doing animation. I think I started doing the MGM movies, like The Secret of Nim and Tom Sawyer and wow. all that stuff. And then yeah. it, like, the show was. Uh, Chalk Sound on Nickelodeon. Mm -hmm. There was Penny Sanchez. That's a wonderful idea, Rudy. And it just kept going. And it's the most fun job ever. You can be on TV all day and no one knows who you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, plain and simply, I was just a freak. <laughs> I grew up here in Detroit. I was born here. Woo! <laughs> Age in Detroit. Holy City, Motown. Better than no town. <laughs> and, uh, you know, growing up here, it's like you had to make your own fun. There was three channels on television if you were lucky to get the right rabbit ears. You know, on top of the TV set, it would have foil to make it pick up more junk. And, uh... Hi. This, ho this hotel only has three channels. <laughs> Anyone? But, I'm kidding. But, um... You know, this was like, we were desperate back in those days. If we saw something that was like 
the coolest thing we ever saw in our lives. She knew it was going to be over in like 15 more minutes. And there was no way you could capture it. You couldn't watch it again. You know what I mean? And it's like that we had desperation. It's like we, we sucked everything out of the TV set and the radio because you wanted to replicate it. So someone who didn't see it, you're trying to tell them how cool it was. And it's like, did you see that thing last night? And go, oh, no, I missed it. Let me show you. You know, and, and I would start to act like that with people and uh, want to do voices and just annoying noises. I was always toreting out noises. And <laughs> um, but I got, uh, I was in bands for years. I used to play in bands. And then around the uh, 80s, um, I was done playing in bands and I got into radio in Boston, kind of accidentally. And uh, I used to do voices for the morning show. And then I had to write my own stuff because it doesn't come with writers, you know. It's like, get the janitor, maybe he's got a cool character voice. And that's how we worked. And, you know, I did that for a number of years in Boston, and then I realized I gotta, I gotta go to New York. You know, and so I went to New York City and I worked on the Howard Stern show for a few years. Yeah, that was an eye-opener. <laughs> hey, Robin, I just farted. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that was an eye-opener. I learned a lot about comedy on there because they had people like Jackie the Joke Man Martin who was a living compendium of jokes. There wasn't, genius. Yeah. It, comedy genius. He, but he used to write stuff for me. And people used to think that all he did was tell cornball jokes. He was the drunk guy at the end of the bar. Yeah, you yeah, know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it. Um, but, uh, you know, I learned from these guys a lot of timing and a lot of riffing on the run. And uh, it was cold in there. Like, if, if you sucked or you didn't, you know, get the right witty little thing going that day, they'd come down on you. You know, it was cold in there. And uh, sometimes it'd be like, yeah, the 49 year old man thinking he's funny. You know, just stuff like that. It was too easy because you couldn't say anything because you'd lose. You know, and uh, but I, I realized that you know Phil Hartman once called me. He's so great of him, so generous to call my house looking for me, and I called him back, and it was him because I know guys like Maurice, John, anybody could have pulled that joke off and said I'm Phil Hartman. And but he just called up to say he was a fan. And I said, well, I kind of know who you are, too. He says, yeah, I got your number from one of the guys on the set here. He says, you know, you ought to come out to Hollywood. He says, that's where all the work is for a guy like you. He says, look me up. I'll help you get acclimated. And it was like, it was the nicest thing that somebody could have told you, especially from show business. I think that, I think that across the board, people in voiceover are more, more generous as far as actors are concerned, just because they... They don't need anybody blowing smoke up their wazoo, you know, because, you know, it's just, they, they're doing something that they love so much. Well, you're not, you're, you're also, you're not fighting for a bigger trail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, not, no, no, so not doing yeah, that. And it's, it's true. What, it's, it's the best job I've ever done as an actor. It's the most fun. Um, it, there was a time where, we were, if we had been carried longer with clerks and ministers, we wanted, we wanted to record an entire session completely in underwear and just have it as a joke amongst us. <laughs> you could have. You could have. You could have. Oh, that's the underwear. We did it. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> um, well, we and, did the opposite. We did suit day on Futurama. We yeah. decided, we decided that, actually it was your idea. It was my we, idea and then I didn't show up in a suit. We flip-flopped yeah. next day. <laughs> we like, let's, let's do it. Let's, let's do it like Mel Blankies do. The suits and ties. Too bad. Everybody wore a suit and tie the next day and recorded the show it's in a suit and tie. tie. Except the genius here. Uh, I'm flip-flops. The Maggio. But doesn't it? But doesn't the clothes also change how you perform? I find like if you're in if you're in a suit, it does that restriction. You all of a sudden come out with this kind of different, I think, take on a character. You become more. I, I think that that's more. I think that's more a costume. Yeah, yeah I, th I think that that helps with with a, with a physical. I mean. Yeah, that that, that's 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 the that's the art of the of voice acting. Really, is like acting with your hands tied behind your back. Right. You know, there's you, you have to make your you have to make your voice sound like it's wearing a suit. Yeah, right. I will tell you, you know? that, that entire day I did not burp the part once. I was just better behaved, which Billy was very grateful for. I was because he was there. That's right, Robin. <laughs> what else is Methane makes room clear. And, um, 
I was never a real straight announcer because nobody wanted to hear that from me. And uh, Moda's Lexus ads. I never did like anything just straight because everybody knows that I'm whacked out and they'll hire me for screaming and yelling and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, when we were wearing the suits and ties that day, all of a sudden, automatically, it was like, this portion of our show is brought to you by Bluetooth. Now brain cancer comes in a new color. Blue. <laughs> Bluetooth. <laughs> and by Tang. Now in... <laughs> and by Tang. Now in orange and boom. <laughs> you know, and that was like... like, like, like I love that joke. I love that joke. It's so stupid. <laughs> I think I said it. I, I heard it like 20 million times. I still love that joke. <laughs> Ever since the Challenger, it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we are the inventors of the disaster joke, by the way. No, what's your one? Disaster yeah. joke. Who's got the Who's got the feedy back one? Who's got the one that's just it's kind of weird? Now it's, now it's me. Now you're just messing with us. So what was the absolute word weirdest? <laughs> I just want a whopper, sir. I just want a whopper. Dude, you find it weird that I'm the straight one in this movie? Oh, um, awesome. But go ahead, you were saying. Well, I don't, I don't, I wanted a Whopper, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, you know, Wait, weirdest road, like, they, and not, you know, not a weirdest character on Control, but what, what was the weirdest gig that you were booked, like, you want me to do a what? You know, like, did you ever do, like, a, um, a, a voiceover for, like, erotica books or anything like that? No, no. I'm just asking. Yeah. <laughs> The lady hits a beach wearing her crazy outfits. Bizarre. Oh, yeah. It's a naked lady story. Here comes a naked lady. Look out. Oh, no. That's weird. I, I did, a, I did a, a film a couple years ago that people were telling me that they're seeing now. Um, called about Carl Panzram, and he was a serial killer, and I played the voice of him, and it's scary. It's, it's really it's scary. It's really scary, and I I didn't like doing it, <laughs> and I did it anyway, and, and it's out now. People are like, I really like you, Carl Panzram. I don't know whether to take that as a compliment or be like, I really go, need, need to go get some psychological help or something like that. But that was a funky gig. Every once in a while, you get a gig where you just like, you know, where someone, someone's directing you that can't, that can't deviate from the norm or is unable to deviate from, from what the producer or the writer is, is like, no, I want it to sound like this. And you, you give them 10 takes and you, you get it, but they still don't hear it. You have to do it again. And it gets frustrating. It, it just, get, it, the only time this job, it's frustrating is when somebody is sticking their nose in it, if you will. You know what I, you know what I mean? Like it's because I don't. I love this job. I love this job so much. But when somebody's going, yeah, um, could you do that one more time? And that was great. That was excellent. Now can you do it again with it? And it's just like they're oh, called the network. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. But it's just I don't know. Sometimes there's. Sometimes it's, you want to play, and you know, you have a, you have a better yeah. take on something that yeah. you do. Yeah, it's so funny. They hire you because they know you're funny, you're stand up, and you have this great timing and all this stuff. But then when they get you into the studio, it's like, yeah, I'm about all that great timing and that great wit, and yeah. we, we want to do it like this. Well, then you should have hired that dude. Yeah, that's, that's, that's not that's me. The, that's yeah. the problem with Madison Avenue is they always want to co opt right. something that's back where they could control. You know, and put him in a Gap commercial or something. And then, and then could you do more of the uh, the, the break dancing, as they call it? Oh, leave the, MC Hammer alone. <laughs> yeah, really. It made him thirty-three million dollars. He went through it quickly, but it made him that much. E equals MC Hammer. Yeah, it was funny. Like every uh, television show had come had to have some sort of local rap dude. Yeah. You know, or get that urban kid in there. He knows rap. Yeah, but it's like if they put, we've been doing things for a long time and there's always somebody that comes in and goes, you know that, that bit you did the other day, it worked really great, do it again. 
And it's like, no man, that ain't how it works. It's like, what comes out, comes out. Mm. And he thinks that comedy could be co-opted like that. Mm. And it's uh, stifling, because I was doing a voiceover, it was really uncomfortable. I wasn't getting what they wanted, and then I said, can I do something of my own? And they said, sure, sure. And I started doing something, and behind that glass, I saw all these faces turn to the face of no breaks. You know, they were like, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it just was so uncomfortable. You know what I used to say, though? I said, uh, I'll stay as long as you want. I got all day and into the night. You know, and then they had to figure out something. Because they spend most of their time picking the ant shit out of pepper, you know? <laughs> With tweezers. With tweezers. Let's see here. Let's see. Oh, my God, please. Okay. <laughs> So, John, you brought a, a DVD uh, of the subject. Yeah. Do you want to play you it? You know, I have a documentary called I Know That Voice. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but um, we, uh, I, have a, I, have a, I have clips from it I'd like to show you guys. It might actually, it's, it's all about this subject. So, if we could turn it on. Do you on. want to see clips, folks? Yeah. 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 Let's show, show, the show, show me the money. Lower the lights. Can we have, we, is, is that possible? possible? Lower the lights in here? Is it possible to lower? We get all like sexy and stuff. Oh, here we go. <laughs> is, is it's, just gonna, it's just gonna play. All of my fears. Wow. Find out what they say. It sounds like it's still a song. So that, so that we can show you. There you go. You know, everything you always wanted to know about voice acting, but we're afraid to ask. You go to dinner parties, do we do? I said, I'm a voice actor. Okay. Hey, they have dinner. His friends trying to explain what exactly do you do? What do you mean you're a voice actor? What does that mean? Well, I go to a room and they give me a script. And you know when you do that in a world, one man. That's me. You're the one man? No, no, I'm not the one man. I'm the guy that says one man. Well, wait a second. Well, that's just that voice. Yeah, but did you ever stop to think that there's actually a guy in a room reading that? We uh, brought people in for, for tours and to visit and stuff like that, and you really see that it's just. I had no idea this is yeah. how you did this. It's I don't know what they thought process. Yeah. Uh, you know, I would say that if people had any idea how much work really went into animation, they would look at it with a lot more sort of a sense of awe. There's nothing wrong with your television set. Do not attempt to adjust your picture. We are controlling the transmission. This is my voice on TV. And there's always that fun game of going, who is that? Who is that? Or listening to commercials and hearing the voice and going, I know who that is. You're on SpongeBob? <laughs> I love that. I love the fact that they don't know. I mean, Mr. Krabs, we mean you don't know? <laughs> I love like, the look in the little kid's eyes when they find out and they say, you know, can you do the voice, which happens nearly every day. And it's just sort of the way their eyes pop. Bobby kind of sounds like this, Larry. Are you a Jewish fellow? That's so interesting. I do love the fact that Nancy Cartwright is a woman. And she plays that And it freaks kids out. Kids will say to me, do Bart, do Bart. And if it's a little guy, I'll say close your eyes. Because, come on, I'm a chick. I don't have nine spikes on the top of my head. I'm certainly not ten years old. But, you know, for a little kid, close your eyes. Hi, I'm Bart Simpson. What's happening? And, <gasps> to all you hear, all you need really is the sound, right? I think it's great. On camera, I'm pretty much limited to, you know, what you see here. I mean, yeah, you could put me in old age makeup, and I have to play an older version of myself, but uh, you can't put me in young makeup and make me, you know, 10 years old again. But I can play 10, you know, in a cartoon. I can easily do that. I can play an you know, older version of myself. Uh, you know, I can I can play, I can play a female if I wanted to. Doing a show like American Dad, we have such enormous casts every single week, and because we can't you know, be using 20 or 30 actors, we have to do a lot of, we have to fill in and do a lot of different characters. So I've gotten over the last eight years to really be able to stretch my range and really get an opportunity to do things that I wouldn't normally have gotten to do. Animation, I think now for me, takes the place of stage because stage I could do lots of different characters that I would never get cast on on film, but it's like stretching. You know, you can stretch on stage and do you know, very bizarre old men or, or young young women or boys or whatever you want to do on stage, you can do the same thing in animation. Everyone's kind of got a little 
a little bag that, of, of tricks and a little cart that they bring around with them, actually. At least that's how I look at it. You know, occasionally someone needs a... Like a pig, but, but, but that can be... You can open up the, the chambers in your throat to, to make it larger. You can, you can modify the column of air. You can just squinch it up there and in all these just horrific kinds of ways. Opportunity. It is a place where people who live and breathe and bleed for this stuff go to be passionate with one another. The cons are great. It's like I'm a beetle. It's nuts. This is gonna be fun. All right, big daddy, come from. I should have put some of that eye stuff on my face. I have to get my box lunch. <laughs> Going to the San Diego Comic Con or Dragon Con in, in Atlanta or any of these places, you know, it's like a company picture. You see people you work with all the time. You know, it's, it's really, uh, it's really fun. Anything you're a rabid fan of is cool, man. And it's like, I think that the Comic Con thing did something really great because it gave these people who are so into comics and cartoons and fantasy and anime and all these mediums, it's like it gave them a place to go. Yeah, conventions are a, a trip. It's really been amazing to see the fans. Isn't that ridiculous? These people are that sick. They're super fans. We do a signing, and we get to interact with the kids and fans. You know, that that's always great. Yeah, we'll the tea so we all know where we are. It's a chance for, if, for somebody who you really like something, and you get to actually meet the people who do it. It's a place where fans can completely be themselves. You know, where they can live out their fantasy with people that are of like mind. Good for them. How oh my dog, that was sexy. These people know who we are. And it's really lovely to treat them like rock stars. And these characters have such a profound effect on many people's lives. And that's a very special thing to be part of. It's also like cool to meet all the people who actually want to see you. That's like fun. I like doing panels and stuff. I love doing comic cons and comic book shows where they are gracious enough to have voice people come and talk about the craft. There's so many people that light up that are interested in it and I've been blown away. Still better than your cookie. What's wrong with my cookie? The best part, and it's going to sound so cheesy, but it's the truth is you meet the fans, and you go, thank you, thank you, thank you for being into it, I'm glad you like that. It's worth doing, and it's fun. If you can get through the sea of people. Sometimes you walk around with a baby, because you can't move faster than a baby can, and you're just like waddling, uh, and everyone's like bumper to bumper, that's why you can't, everyone's just clustered together. Celebrities at Comic-Con, they escort them through like these back alleyways throughout um, they escort them like basically through the garbage area. It was just rad. <laughs> we sort of sneak in the back, you know, where the loading dock is. <laughs> we do all these dark corridors. Come on, dude. I know. You've got hustle, man. This is this is Comic Con for me. What's the Jimmy Dog down to Mexico? I wanted to make this documentary because I wanted to honor these people. I wanted to show that my peers are really incredible. They're an incredibly talented bunch. I wanted to show those people. I wanted to show their face. I wanted to show them as, as, as champions of the industry. 
When we worked on Clerks the Animated Series, we worked with Lauren Tom. Who was oh, it's great. Oh, she's, she was phenomenal. She's, phenom she's, she's uh, Amy Wong on Futurama. She's my smizma. Oh, my. <laughs> she is absolutely amazing at how quickly she adjusted. We had, um, in one of the episodes of the courtroom episode, where Jay falls in the store and he sues the quick stop and we go to trial, and then they bring up these two giggling girls to, to cross-examine. And um, so Kevin and Dave Mandel, who were uh, directing the episodes, um, would say to her, um, okay, we need a girl, um, and she's like, well, how old? And we, they would be like, I don't, what do you mean, how old? And she's like, well, I could do 19, teenager, and we're like, okay, or I could do 15, or 12, or 9, and we're like, let's hear that. And she, you know, obviously I can't do that, but she would do that. She would go through that list of like what a 19-year-old girl would sound like, and then bam, down to 12. And like even adjusted, like, oh, maybe 15. And it's like you hear it, you feel that texture in her voice. And, and it's that type of skill set that the people on this panel and many others that you're seeing in this documentary have developed over the years that's just stunning. And people don't get it sometimes that how much work really is involved and how much just a name town of these wonderful actors uh, and artists are, have the capability of, which just blew our mind too. It's, it's a real, it's a real fine dial. It really dial. is. It's it a real fine dial, you really, and, 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 and the, the good ones have it. The good ones have that, and they go. And they adjust immediately. And they, yeah, and, and that's the thing about being a voice actor is that you have to be able to change on the fly. If something, if a choice isn't right, you can go back and do it again, but you gotta make a different choice, and you gotta be on top of it, and because there's no time. You know, and if you're working with someone new, a new director especially, you, you're supposed to walk in, I assume, to the studio with at least like six or seven choices at the same type of dialogue. Well, yeah. There's, a, there's yeah. a group of people that uh, have the luxury of being exactly who and what they are. They're called <coughs> excellent. <laughs> yeah, they're awful. Yeah, they're terrible. Everything flatlines. And I'm trying telling you. I tried doing more voices on that, and they were like, no, 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 stay to Dante. They're like, I want to do Clayton. It's awesome. You know, and they're like, you know, they have that proclivity in you. Oh. Well, you know, so you've been up to my room, haven't you? Um, <laughs> you know, uh, but it, it's those type of things that you, you, you walk into a room, you've got to have those choices available. What kind of advice, um, we're running down from the hour, um, what kind of advice would you say to any of the young people, especially you're even older? I mean, look at Tony Salas back in the day, he didn't start acting until 40. But there are people who have still that opportunity to try to take this as a career. Anybody have some sage, wisdomy type of voice, or just like, eh, just do it. Develop your acting chops. Yeah, forget about it. Like the idea that it's voice acting. Uh, voice acting is acting. You just don't have to worry about the hair lighting makeup. But learn to act. Get in an improv class, get in a yeah. get, get into get into scene study. Uh, take a comedy writing class. Because I learned a, a, a tremendous amount about what is funny from a writing class I took with, with Danny Simon, who's you know, Simon's brother. Uh, you know, I learned a lot of the rules of comedy there. So study. Study the craft of acting and then and apply that to voice acting. It's not just my technique is a very small part. And listen, listen to people, and wherever you are, listen to them, and take that in because you never know. You never know what you're going to need. You know. Yeah, if you've got an interesting character in your life, if your high school math teacher had a nasal voice, you know, learn to do him. Yeah. Because it's the non-celebrities that you can bring in. And people go, that's a brilliant character. It's like, well, it's my high school math teacher. Yeah. Bring the best that, characters know. are actual people in your life. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and another thing, if you, do, if you do bad impressions, bad impressions those, the, alone are good characters. Like, you know, if, if, you know. It's a voice no Here we go. Here, here's, here's an example. Here's a good Ronald Coleman. Ah, uh, if I were king, what tributary nation would I bring to follow the deep receptor? Here's a bad one. Follow your nose, it always knows. Get on Fruit Loop cereal with that orange lemon and cherry figures. Right? I've been doing that since 1987. It's a bad impression of, a, of what could have been a good impression. So, and it's a bad, it's a, it's a good impression of Paul Frees's bad impression, which we started with. We, we talk about this particular subject in the movie, and by the way, uh, I have. Um, it's going to be out. Um, 
in demand, uh, it's going to be on in demand starting December 1st. It'll be, uh, it'll, that'll go till the 21st of December, and then it's on iTunes and Amazon and other VOD platforms on January 7th. But I have copies of the film here. I have special convention, I have a special conven convention uh, edition DVD, and so it's exclusive, and I have them here, and I got them down shameless downstairs. Shameless plug. Total shameless plug. <laughs> but I have them downstairs, 20 bucks. We're going to leave the, the last few minutes. Uh, if anybody has some questions, raise your hand. I'll point you out. If you could chat it out, that'd be great. Gentleman in the blonde. Uh, yeah. Um, I just have a question. You know, when you have so many characters, especially on one show, how are you able to separate through them as you're recording? Oh, this is one. They, yeah, but they'll also separate it if it, if it's you know if if the characters start to bleed into each other. You know, you'll do you'll do one character, you know, one take, and then you know uh, the, you'll change characters and do the other character and the other take. Billy, though, I've, I've seen yeah, I've seen Billy do three pages of dialogue by himself, so I don't know about that. <laughs> so, yeah, pretty amazing. Little girl up in the front, do you have a question, or she just likes to say hi? Yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Characters, if you're the same person, I think it's schizophrenia. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big word. That's crazy. You can Google it. Get on your dad's like iPad. Google it. Schizophrenia. It's not how it's spelled, how it sounds. Though. It's going to be a trick question. That's going to be bonus time for you. You know what? That stuff chooses you. You can't choose something like that. I know I didn't consciously ever choose to do something like this. But it comes along in life. Everybody's going to get the same feeling if you're creative or you're an artist or anything. I encourage it because it grabs you and you've got to kind of blow with it. You know, there's no, there's no like control going on or absolute decision making. Right? But if you have creativity and you have talent, you know, bring it because, um, you know, we need it. And uh, we're saving a seat for you. Definitely don't ever quash your uh, your creativity in your mind. As crazy as it may sound in your head or whatever, try it. The worst they go is, eh, not really. And then you go, okay, it's not for you. Then you save it for another audition. But you don't listen to them. Right, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Until you're on the med. Yes, sir. Uh, in the past, uh, voice actors have said, hey, if you can get a demo tape out there, get that circulating, that's a good way into the business. But with digital media kind of dying, Exactly how much beer do I have to buy you guys to help me out? <laughs> uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, and now it's, now it's, instead of a demo tape, it's an MP3 of your stuff. You know, it's just, it's just changed with the technology. Which will live forever on the internet, so yes. make sure it's good. Right? Yeah, exactly. Um, if you can put yourself up on, you know, on a, on a, if you can get yourself a .com name or whatever, or even other housing sites to just have it where you can send a web address to other agents and stuff. That's actually true. And do okay. a series of different types of voices and types of, to give your range so you're not just pigeonholed as that one type of voice your, guy. Your demo, a, your demo should be no longer than 90 seconds. That, and should true. and should show show your range and should show what you can do within those characters and you know three or four different voices or something like that right you know right. Uh, three or four find yourself an agent man that's it and an agent always helps sir yes um earlier today uh john i talked to you a little bit about your work in uh, as joker and under the red hood and i know you were very happy to talk to me about that role. I was wondering if you could kind of reprise a little bit of what you were talking about to these people about how you approached the role. Well, you know, I, I, he's talking about um, Under the Red Hood, which is, uh, yeah, I played the Joker in that, which was really a, 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 a blast. It was amazing. The only, the only drawback is dealing with Mark Hamill's fans. <laughs> <laughs> Man, they're brutal. Um, but, um, but, I mean, it was, it was really, really cool, and it was... It was a really dark, dark take on the Joker. I think it was probably the most violent Joker around, next to Heath Ledger's on-camera performance. Um, I mean, the opening, I don't know if you've seen it, but the opening, I won't spoil it for you, the opening starts with you know, the Joker beating Robin to, to death with a crowbar. So it's kind of like, hey, all right, this is a little, you know, and you know, Yes, I know. Isn't that awful? <laughs> um, yeah, but, she's a good. But, uh, 
but it, it, you know, it was it was wonderful because I got to work with um, uh, Andre Romano, who was a uh, who's a multi multi Emmy award winner uh, for voice directing, directed him in Painting the Brain, and, and, and you know, and all of us I think. Are, um, but you know, to be able to do that and create something that you know heavy duty as a as a as a voice was so enriching, you know, because you don't, you don't get to play those kind of parts a lot. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. We have the Games of Thrones uh, panel coming in here in a minute, and uh, I don't want to mess with them. They got weapons. Um, so, a big round of applause for all of our guests. Thank you. We're all the big bizarre martinum down below here, just past the stage. So please come by our table, say hello. If you want to talk more, have more questions, please stop on by. We don't bite. We're very good people. Enjoy yourselves. Play safe, and we'll see you guys later on. Thank you very much.